Hello, everyone. Today on the Final Bar, it's Friday, August 5th. We will wrap the week. We'll look at how the week has evolved over the last five trading days. A lot to talk about. Really, Wednesday was the story. It was like a bull market Wednesday and then four other days that happened around that day. We'll look at the evidence of the overall trend in the market this week, how 4,200 on the S&P, the NASDAQ as well. We have key levels to pay attention to. Stocks like Adobe and Microsoft and others attempting to break out, ladies and gentlemen. This is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts, using the technical analysis toolkit, the best practices of behavioral investing to better uh, get inside our heads or better uh, maybe get out of our heads, get out of the way of uh, rational decision making and also focus on uh, the emotions of the investors around us. The technical toolkit is designed to help you minimize behavioral biases in your own practice and take advantage of the fact that other investors are uh, largely irrational. And if you can strike that balance well with good routines, good discipline, and a good awareness of what's happening around you, we think you can set yourself up for good success. Now, it's a lot of question marks in this market. Even the conversations I had with my guests this week and even last week not 100% in agreement. I'm hearing half of the discussions be sort of, we're at the end of a bear market rally. This is probably it before we retest the uh, the June lows. On the other half, I get a long and strong, everything's great. Let's find more stocks to add to a portfolio. It's risk on. It's a very much a question mark. I think if certain things happen, it can't be a question mark anymore. And we'll try to identify some of those together on the show. We have great guests on the show, some really fun conversations this week. Just wanted to mention what's coming up next week. Ari Wald from Oppenheimer is joining us on Tuesday the 9th. On Wednesday the 10th, JC O'Hara from uh, MKM Partners. On Thursday the 11th, Mark Newton, who's the technical analyst at Fundstrat Global Advisors in New York. Also, in case you missed it, our le latest episode of The Pitch airing today. On August 5th, you can uh, watch that. If you miss it on the air, you can watch our recap or uh, or the full episode, by the way, on StockChartsTV.com or our YouTube channel. A lot of great uh, uh, content recently in recent weeks, sort of mid-year market outlooks, charting the second half, a lot of fantastic forward-looking technical analysis happening on the channel. So check out all of those episodes if you miss them. Miss them. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. Let's talk about this overall approach and how the uh, the week played out, as I mentioned, it was sort of Wednesday and then the other four days. And Wednesday was very different, an outlier in terms of a strong move to uh, to the upside. Before we get into the chart of the S&P 500 and dig into it in a little more detail, I did want to mention the uh, the poll we asked recently. We always have a poll going on our live stream page at stockcharts.com, uh, also on our social media accounts. So follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get them there as well. Is the next 25% move in Bitcoin higher or lower? How awesome is this? Literal 50-50 split between higher and lower. I will tell you, looking at the chart of Bitcoin, I get it. I get that outcome. I get that answer. Um, if there was a neutral option, I bet it would have been overwhelmingly neutral. That would have actually been an interesting uh, exercise to put a sort of, you know, not a 10% move either way. And I wonder how many people would have voted in, in that one. You know, if you look at the chart of Bitcoin overall, it's been uh, it's been appreciating over the last six weeks. Kind of a nice trend of higher highs and higher lows matches the general risk on feel that we've uh, that we've had with stocks, with growth stocks in particular, uh, leading. And I guess if uh, you know maybe some similarities between the types of investors drawn into emerging growth at these levels, uh, similar might be might be ones buying cryptocurrencies and adding back to um, you know crypto positions. Um, so the, the reality is we're making higher highs and higher lows. When that stops, that's when you can say that this tactical uptrend uh, is over. We're back above the 50-day moving average for the first time in April. That's encouraging. The question is what's next, right? And I, and I think as stocks have reached key resistance, it's hard to imagine a scenario where stocks would pull back from here and Bitcoin and Ether and others would just rip to the upside. 
Um, I certainly think you have upside clearly defined around 30,000. That would be a decent uh, upside uh, up, upside uh, objective. So right now we're sort of in that no man's land between 30,000 in the upside and 17,500 on the downside. That is quite a big range. So if I had to vote, I'd probably say the next 25% move is higher, but I don't know if I have very high conviction in that one at all. Um, and the only the only reason I'm saying this because I'm looking at a retest of thirty thousand. That would pretty much get you there. That could be an interesting, um, you know, certainly an interesting potential future path for uh, for Bitcoin. Let's continue on with our uh, our market recap. Really, is called Wrap the Week on Friday. We like to break down the overall trend in these markets. Let's do three things. We'll start with the S and P very quickly and the uh, major averages. Let's see what happened uh, today. Then we'll look at the week. We'll look at the last five trading days, and then we'll go into the Mindful Investor Live chart list, try to talk through some larger themes in terms of price, breadth, and sentiment. You know, Starting with the overall markets, flat at the end of the day for the S&P, choppy and, and below the zero level for most of the day. Nice rally in the last hour, got the, uh, the, the losses to a minimum with the S&P getting up to around 41.45. That's only about 0.1.2% below yesterday. So really not much at the end of the day. The NASDAQ down about half a percent, the Dow up a quarter of a percent. So similar to yesterday, if I remember right, sort of a split between the Dow and the NASDAQ having uh, differing movements. And then the s and kind of in the middle. Mid caps and small caps both up about half a percent. The VIX coming down a little bit. I was talking with uh, a uh, um, uh, in an interview earlier today and was asked about the VIX. And my, my general thesis, my general comment on the VIX is volatility has declined, right? We've gone down to uh, 21, we're nearing 20. If you look at many of the bear market rallies in 2022, they have all topped out right about when the VIX is around 20. To flip that, anytime the VIX has gotten down to 20, those have been very sellable tops. What would change that is if the VIX can get low and stay low. We talked about that on yesterday's show. So if you missed that, miss that one, uh, we talked about sentiment and dug into the VIX chart a little bit. Uh, in more detail. Interest rates all moving higher today uh, across the curve. The 10-year yield up to 284, 30-year yields around 307, uh, the uh, dollar index up. And that's one of the interesting changes in what we've seen in the last four to six weeks where the dollar has been very weak, which has allowed growth stocks in particular to rally. Today, we get the opposite. Today feels a lot more like what most of 2022 has felt like, where it's been uh, you know, energy working, uh, value-oriented defensive areas of the market working pretty well, growth stocks struggling as rates in the dollar go higher, sort of back to that thesis uh, today, uh, really after the uh, employment numbers this morning. Commodities mixed, to be honest with you, gold and silver down a pretty good amount. We talked about the challenges with gold stocks. I This could end up being the world's most ultimate opportun buying opportunity for gold and gold stocks. I'm just not seeing anything on the chart besides the fact that it's gone down a lot. I'm not seeing any sort of inspiration to own those types of uh, that that area of the market. I think if you're buying gold here, the 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 argument has to be we've gone down a ton and maybe we're at long-term support levels. And, and so I get that argument of bottom fishing and trying to trying to make a contrary bet because clearly no one else wants to own gold. I still think that's a pretty aggressive position to be taking at current levels, particularly with do the dollar having pulled back so much and bouncing higher, that would kill any upside for uh, for the gold trade. Finally, as I mentioned, cryptocurrencies having a decent a uh, week, Bitcoin up about 1%, Ether up about 4% to 1680, 1675, we'll call it. Bitcoin nearing that 23,000 level uh, as, we're, uh, as we're live with the show here after the close on Friday. Let's look at the wrap the week chart. This is just paying attention to um, major asset classes using ETFs and then Bitcoin as well. And looking from last Friday uh, to where we are today, what has been the change in these four different assets? Let me make sure I include Friday. There we go. So now we're starting the clock. Last Friday, we're going through uh, today. What have the returns been? Here's the S and P 500, really a flat week, right? I mean, down the first couple of days a little bit, big move uh, higher on Wednesday, but then sort of back to that slow and steady decline. It was sort of a, a snoozer of a week overall for the S and P, finishing the week about a third of a percent higher. But that's not much. Um, it wasn't down a lot, so that's good uh, if you're if you're bullish. But you know, interesting. We've we've essentially stalled out as the S and P has approached that key resistance range, 4,150 to 4,200, very much still in play uh, going into the weekend here. Uh, but the S&P turning in a third of a percent higher. Underperforming the S&P this week, uh, we have emerging markets, very similar, about a quarter of a percent. In red, we have uh, bond prices. This is using the TLT, which had a weekday today as rates bounced higher, down about two-thirds of a percent. 
3.9% loss for Bitcoin and the worst performer crude oil. This is using the USO, which is down 8.3%. Everything else outperformed stocks sort of in lockstep. We have the US dollar and gold up about 0.7%. Small cap stocks up 1.9%. The NASDAQ, the biggest winner of the group, that's the Qs up 2%. So again, the overall uh, you know, general theme here over the last six weeks has been strength in gold and weakness elsewhere. And that's been uh, you know, an interesting change from most of 2022. The big question, and this is what I've asked every one of my guests, and this is what I try to answer the best I can every, uh, every day is, is this a bear market rally nearing its end or at its end versus the beginning of a much you know, multi-step uh, move to the upside? I hope what you found from some of the conversations I've had, there is no real clear consensus. I think a very legitimate data-backed argument could be made for both sides of that. Now, in the end, what could happen as we get to uh, the mindful investor chart list, uh, I think what could happen is we all are right. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. It can all be a question of timeframes, right? And and if I loudly enough say, I think you know the market's going to go higher, I'm not giving a particular time frame to that. So eventually, I will most likely be vindicated by that bullish argument by the simple fact that stocks in general tend to go higher over you know decades and decades right so if i'm bullish on stocks with no defined time frame that's a pretty decent bet to be made i think the question is where we're at right now what could happen i i think is you you sell off from here and i'm i'm still in that bear market rally thesis i i've seen enough to suggest that there is a a strong likelihood that we retest the lows particularly going into the fall doesn't mean we can't go a little bit higher from here and i think that could happen but Overall, I think we retest the lows. I think that sets us up for a great buying opportunity going into the end of the year. Let's say that would happen. Let's say we stall out here, go back to S&P 30, well, I'm going to call it SPIs 360, and then rotate higher. We could finish more toward the all-time highs for the S&P, but kind of everyone wins, right? We're bearish enough that we retest the lows. That sets the stage for a big double bottom and a move higher. That could very much be a potential future path for, uh, for stocks. But at the end of the day, it's not about what could happen or should happen. It's about what is happening. So let's quickly finish off our uh, Wrap the Week segment looking at the evidence on the charts. My medium-term model as of Friday's close, as of today, turns back bullish. It has only been turned bullish one other time in 2022, and that was the last week in March, which was basically the end of this bear market rally. So the similarities are so stark, I have to make that point and assume that that is my, uh, my base case. Short-term model remains bullish here with a nice uh, up, upswing for stocks overall, and the long-term model remain remaining uh, bearish. So as of today, short-term and medium-term bullish, long-term uh, still remaining bearish. Now, the daily chart of the S&P, I think, tells you everything you need to know about where we're at right now and where we've been in previous bear market rallies. Bear market rallies have been marked in 2022, particularly this one in March, with a sharp move off of all-time lows after a bit of a higher low, sort of a, a brief retest of that range. You make a new highs, you fail to get above with any significance the previous swing high. That's kind of where we're at right now. And that 4,600 level in 2000, uh, excuse me, in February is basically the 4,175 level, we'll call it. Uh, right now, which means I think we stay, uh, you know, within this blue shaded area and roll over. All of a sudden, we just have a repeat of that same issue. What would change it? We get above 4,200. That would help. The momentum increases well above 60. That would help. Um, breadth conditions elsewhere improve. The advanced decline lines start to break out. That is something we've not necessarily seen. These are the cumulative advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange for large cap, mid cap, small cap. You can see uh, one of these has been popping, uh, excuse me, we're back in February again. Hold on a second. I was just, as I'm looking at this, I'm like, hold on a second. That's not the right time here. Let me give you one year. All right, here we go. Now this looks current. So the small cap breadth has indeed broken above the June high. The small cap breadth, the uh, small cap, the mid cap breadth has stalled right at the high from June. Mid -cap, or Large cap breadth has not made it there. And the NYSE overall breadth has not gotten there as well. So it's not just the S&P needing to eclipse those previous highs. It's other measures, other measures of conditions to addressing the individual stocks and the strength that we may uh, we may see there. That's what we've not necessarily seen yet. And while I'm seeing a lot of stocks that are able to break above those highs, particularly in the technology sector, the fact that these breadth indicators have not done it yet tells me that there's still a lot to be proven before this feels like an overall bull market thesis. Right now, it is a rally that has drawn in a lot of excitement 
That is what a bear market rally would do. The way that I would change my mind, one of those data points, these advanced decline lines breaking above their June highs and not looking back. That's what sets us up for strength going in the upcoming weeks and the upcoming months. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back powering up your use of the Stock Charts platform. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We really appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in these, uh, in these markets. A couple quick announcements before we get to our next segment. Power up. First, we welcome your questions. We'll do a mailbag segment here in a few minutes, and we would love to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag, which will be Tuesday of next week. You can get your questions to us via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Chart YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Tuesday's show of next week. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. I mentioned our latest episode of The Pitch, our mid-year market outlook called Charting the Second Half, which was just released this week. Our latest market outlooks from Martin Pring, from Larry Williams. Some fantastic guest discussions I've had with Ms. Schneider and uh, who else have we had on here? Um, uh, Jay Soloff. We've had... Um, Jonathan Krinsky, really interesting discussion about bear market rallies. So much more, all for free at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Our next segment is called Power Up. What we like to do every Friday is just give you one little nugget, one little idea of how you can upgrade your usage of the Stock Charts platform. It is a powerful tool with so many great features, many of which uh, you may not know about. Today, we're going to talk briefly about chartless I have an insane number of these. It's kind of an issue I have because I always like to create new chart lists. When I come up with an idea or come up with a theme, I like to create a chart list to sort of uh, make sense of those things. Uh, here, let's say we're picking one that looks at the S&P 100. And what I want to show you is if you go to where it says edit list, you will see that the editing capabilities, what we call the edit page on, uh, on for chart lists, has been completely uh, overhauled. It's a much more of an interactive experience before you really had to select individual tickers and start to make changes. Now it's more like an Excel spreadsheet and you can do everything right from here. So first off, you want to take everything in the list and pop it somewhere else. Just click here where it says select all. You can then take action on whatever uh, items you've selected. Of course, you can also select individual ones by just clicking the uh, dialog box and then move, delete, copy, whatever it is that you'd like to do over there. And it works very, very well. You can also edit these uh, titles and add comments directly from the page. So just type here and type in something else that you want to put in uh, the description of the uh, chart or the name of the chart. You can also type comments like my kids are great. Again, just putting in here in case my kids happen to watch my show and uh, we can put that other. So this is a great way to save things like a buy sell decision, a position, a, a particular outlook, highlighting stocks that have certain comparisons relating individual charts to other charts. Right? What other tickers does this remind you of? You can put all of that in that comment section. This is a great way to sort of capture your thinking, capture your ideas. You can also make brief uh, changes to your uh, your charts over here on the right side. So you can delete a chart. Um, you can uh, duplicate or copy this one and put it somewhere else or remove the chart somewhere else. So People like Grayson Rose and Greg Schnell and Tom Boley, Arthur Hill, who are power chart list users. I've learned everything about chart lists from watching their shows and being able to talk to them about it. But we've added a lot of the capabilities they've been looking for. And many of you have been requested uh, right here. So when you edit a chart list, enjoy all the really cool new features that we've just added to allow you to upgrade your ability to manage uh, the chart list feature. Our next segment is the Final Bar Mailbag. We are here for your questions at all times. The Final Bar at StockCharts.com is our email. And let's get to question number one. I was looking at a scan for bullish point and figure patterns and then decided to do a candle glance in point and figure duration. How should I use these? Um, let me show you, I think, what you're referring to. So if I go to, let's say, let's bring up a chart list and I'll bring up that chart of the uh, S&P 100. That's a good kind of test list to uh, do. And we'll say candle glance. 
when I do that, this is sort of my custom candle glance chart that I created. Your charts may look kind of like this. It depends on what your setting is, but you can change that in this little drop down that says chart duration. And we give you some common things. A lot of times people just want to look at a two day chart and see what's happening right now, the last couple of months, the last six months, one year custom style. And there's a way you can actually change the candle glance screen so that it has your particular style. There's a little button at there, a little uh, message at the bottom of any of your candle glance pages. Click on that link and it'll show you what you need to do to create your own custom list. This is just the, the custom chart that I created. But we also have this one called point and figure traditional and point and figure percent. This is using our point and figure, figure engine, which is a really beautifully designed uh, tool. Now this uh, point and figure charting, we don't have time in the mailbag to go in depth on point and figure charting. We do have some really good resources on our chart school page. If you look at our YouTube channel, we've had some great videos talking about point and figure charting. I'm making a note to do more of those because I think it's a, it's a part of the system that we could certainly help you use a little more effectively. What this is basically doing is running a little mini point and figure chart of all of the charts uh, in your uh, in your chart list, right? All of the tickers that you have reflected. What's great about this particular view is you can look at them all together. If there's no message up here, no green or red message, it just tells you kind of situation normal. You're tracking the trends. O's are downtrends. Columns of X's are uptrends. This is all defined by the defined by the traditional scaling, which is basically a, um, a one by three. You call it a one by three. Um, point and figure chart, although the range of the price can change that uh, pretty pretty quickly. So again, our chart school page can tell you a little bit more about the mechanics of it. What's great about this though, is a red message tells you you've recently had a sell signal. So if this is, for example, Comcast is giving you a descending triple bottom breakdown. That's when you have these columns of lows and you break down below the previous column of O's, that's called a triple bottom breakdown. And by doing it with the uh, columns uh, uh, descending to the downside, it's called a descended triple uh, bottom pattern. Here, Disney most recently is giving a double top breakout. That's where actually we have a column of X's that exceeds the previous column of X's. That's a traditional buy signal according to the point and figure methodology. So what's really cool about this particular look is you can glance down. What I would do is focus on a couple of things. Number one, do you see any green or red messages for the tickers that you're following? That would tell you there's something actionable in that point and figure chart. You can click on it to drill in a little more uh, more deeply. You can also take a step back and see, broadly speaking, am I seeing more green messages or red messages? When I find charts like Netflix and T-Mobile and Ford all giving buy signals, that might tell me something about a broader change of character in these markets. Finally, pay attention to Price objectives, point and figure charts are great because not only do they give an actionable trigger, they also, there's always a price objective uh, that is aligned with those signals. So look for uh, signals, take a step back and look at overall breadth conditions based on whether you see more bullish or bearish patterns and pay attention to price objectives. That is a quick three minute version on terms of how I would use that candle glance function. There's a lot more to cover uh, there and I would encourage you to look at our chart school, particular on point and figure charts. Let's get to the next question. AMD's trend is upward, but weak relative strength of both semis to tech and AMD to semiconductors. Both RSI and MACD are positive, but ADX is showing no trend. Which indicator would you use? And you talked a little bit more about how the price is, uh, you know, testing a downtrend line. What would you use to confirm um, to confirm your um, thesis? So let me bring up AMD, and your chart inspires me to bring up the Gaddis chart scale. Gaddis Rose did a great job years ago um, and shared this chart style with me. What I like about it has a focus on relative strength in the top half. So before you even look at the price, you talk about how is this stock doing relative to the benchmark? What about the sector relative to the market? What about the group relative to the sector? What about the stock relative to the group? Those are the four relative comparisons you're making. Top to bottom, you can get a brilliant assessment of how AMD is doing relative to all these other uh, buckets of stocks. Now, what's interesting about this is if you look at the trend, you can see certainly in the short term, the trend is higher. And I think if you draw a trend line taking these recent highs, probably would show that we've broken above uh, that descending trend line uh, using the previous highs. I especially like the fact that AMD has gotten above 100. And I will tell you that holding that level, holding that value above 100 would be uh, would be pretty meaningful. Um, I don't have the ADX on here. So let me pop that on here and clean this. Sorry, Gaddis, I'm butchering your chart just a touch but I need to answer this person's question. Here we go. So now we're showing the ADX is relatively low, right? So uh, just broke above 25 this week, but in general, below 25 is kind of the back of the envelope, kind of uh, untrending or non-trending market above 25 would be trending market. So what's interesting is since you sent me that chart, uh, this question, 
And now that we're looking at the chart, I would argue the ADX is actually improving. Getting above 25 is pretty encouraging. So the stock continuing to rally with an improving ADX tells you a well-established uptrend uh, that is continuing. So for me, I kind of like the fact that the ADX is, is improving. If you're not super familiar with the ADX, by the way, uh, a couple of our commentators use it a great deal. Joe Rabel uh, comes to mind. Uh, he answers, uh, he, he hosts the show Stock Talk with Joe Rabel. And I know he would be able to answer that maybe a little more detail in terms of how to think about the ADX uh, input. For me, I don't use the ADX ton. I do use MACD and PPO. And I would tell you, I would be most encouraged by MACD uh, breaking higher. I think the ADX tends to confirm, especially after a market that's been in a downtrend and fairly choppy. I would think of ADX as a little more confirmational. I like the fact that we see improving relative strength across the board over the last six weeks. The more that continues, the more AMD, I would argue, uh, is a pretty attractive setup there. Great question there, and thanks for that. Final question, I downloaded your chart pack. How do I get the support and resistance levels to gravitate to the right axis as the days go by? They stay locked on the day that I downloaded the chart pack. And here's the chart that you sent me. So full disclosure, you added a bunch more moving averages. I, I never have that many moving averages on my chart, although I love, you actually call this a moving average ribbon, which is when you have short-term to long-term, and you can literally look how the shape of this market changed from uptrend on the left side to downtrend to the right. So it's a beautiful way, especially if you go really long-term, that daily moving average ribbon can be a beautiful illustration of how the dynamics on a particular chart uh, have changed. But your comment is more about these annotations here. You downloaded the chart pack, and I'll show you guys how to download that in a minute uh, in case you're unfamiliar. The short answer is these don't update automatically. Uh, we don't have the ability right now to do a trend line or a, 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 uh, a range like this that extends off to the right viewable area. So I actually go in manually when I'm preparing charts and I update them. Is that a little bit manual? It is. I think of it as part of the process of being a technical analyst of going through. And every time I move these over, I'm thinking about whether this level is still in play. Are these the right levels I should be focusing on? So for me, it's become such a part of my process that I actually appreciate that very much. Having said that, I'm not allowed to say too much about it, but stock charts 3.0, our updated version of this uh, is in the works right now. Our head developers are working hard on uh, all the details around uh, redesigning a charting engine from scratch. We'll be releasing it before the end of the year, uh, God willing, uh, probably in the uh, in the fall time frame. Our early tests look fantastic. That is one of the many features I hope uh, we'll be able to include. A lot more flexibility with trend lanes and updating annotations. By the way, if you've not seen that before, that chart pack that was referred, Go to your dashboard, go to where it says chart list, below your list of charts, down at the bottom, you have this little gray button that says manage chart packs, mine is called uh, Dave Keller's morning coffee routine chart pack. Install those, update them when you need, and you get all most of the charts that I show on the air all on your login. We need to wrap the show, folks. We got to go to the three and three. This is three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Let's do it. Chart number one is looking at the new Dow theory. This is a chart I'm referring to often right now because Dow theory is all about confirmation from two different indexes, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ composite has broken above its June high. The S&P has not. You need that to give a new Dow theory buy signal, which means S&P has to get above 4,200 on a closing basis to validate that. Chart number two is Adobe, right? This is one of the many names that while having rallied, NVIDIA is another one that, uh, that comes to mind. Beautiful rally off the June lows, but not above the, the June swing high yet. That's important. I think Adobe has to get above 440 uh, to really validate this as a new uptrend. The more stocks that do that, particularly in the growth areas of the market, the more and more confident I would be about thinking about an overall recovery. Upside, by the way, to 475, 480, that would be a Fibonacci level. Also, the 200-day moving average, which could very much uh, come into play. Finally, to finish on, Devon Energy, DVN, certain earnings uh, this week. I think it was on Monday after the close when they reported or somewhere around there. Uh, what's interesting going into the close, a bullish engulfing pattern, candle, gland, or candle uh, pattern fans, here we go. We had a beautiful doji candle when we last approached the 200-day moving average, chopped around for about a week before resolving to the upside. We tested the 50-day and failed. We are now getting a bullish engulfing pattern at the 200-day moving average. That suggests the next one to three bars are higher. Does that set us up for strength in the energy and cyclical space on Monday? Folks, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for joining us on the final bar every day after the close. We appreciate your support. Thanks again for uh, tuning in to all of our guest interviews. If you missed any of them that I mentioned today, go to StockChartsTV.com. Also, our YouTube channel, all of that is available for free. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great weekend.
We'll see you on Monday. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.